I want to give a, a broader picture and talk a little bit about um, the global health challenges that we face and that a lot of your work feeds into and then think as well just a little bit about Edinburgh University and the Global Health Academy. So, oh, and I've uh, gone the wrong way. Here we are. Global health, you're all familiar with this whole concept of global health and, and it changes a little bit. It changes every decade it changes. But just to summarise again what I mean and where, where I want to go. Global health has to be about social justice and health equity. And we take that for granted and we say, of course, that's what, that's what our work's about. But really, social justice and health equity, and as we go on to think about infectious diseases today, we realise just how little social justice and health equity there is in the world of health. Equity within nations as well as among nations. And it must be about being multidisciplinary because we know that health workers won't solve the problems of the world alone. And yet, the way our systems are siloed, the way our health service is siloed, the way our um, ministries, of, uh, all of our ministries and government are siloed, uh, so much responsibility often just lies on the health service to do things, to change things. But we know with infectious diseases, it's going to be roads, it's going to be logistics. So when we transport, going to make the biggest difference around health services and systems. And global health is, about, is something that defines national, transcends national boundaries. It goes much broader and it requires our global cooperation. The Alma-Ata Declaration, 1978, some time back. Are you familiar with it? At that point, there was this huge optimism that actually by 2000 we could um, bring health for all. There was a tremendous optimism, optimism as well at this point because there was a real effort, a real push to say primary health care is going to be what makes a difference. If we can reconfigure our systems and services, if we can recognise the power of the primary health care worker, if we can place services at community level, if we can work with grassroots situations and grassroots um, services springing up, we can make changes. The Alma Atta Declaration really transformed where global health was at and it, it, it set a set of uh, agendas that could, that could have made a huge, huge difference. And here we are this week. This week's the World Health Assembly, the 67th World Health Assembly. Lots being discussed. Lots of issues that affect us today. I want to read something from this slide. Infectious diseases kill over 17 million people a year. It's a WHO warning slide, a WHO report. Nearly 50,000 men, women and children are dying every day from infectious diseases. Diseases that could be prevented or cured for as little as a single dollar per head. At least 13 new diseases have emerged these last 20 years and they threaten the health of hundreds of millions. And the world has lost sight of its priority to reduce poverty through better health and foster development by fighting disease. It's a real call to arms. We're standing on the brink of this global crisis in infectious diseases and no country is safe from them. And no country can no longer afford to ignore the threat, said the Director General of the WHO. Not Margaret Chan, no. The Director General in 1996, almost 20 years ago, these messages were there. But we could write those same messages today in a World Health Report, because they haven't actually changed. In fact, the numbers have increased somewhat. There have been fantastic changes generally, but the population has risen. We've still got this huge problem with infectious diseases in the world today. And that report did go on to talk about the, you know, the 52 million deaths from causes in 1995. More than 17 million were due to infectious diseases. I'll show you some slides later to show this, this, um, where this is at now and half the world's population at risk of endemic diseases. So we have a call 20 years ago. We had a call 30 years ago. We've got a call today of, of action, taking action. And in our World Health Assembly today, in fact, on, on, on Monday when, when Margaret Chan read her, her report, 
her, her primary message as well was, our children are getting fatter. The key message in the World Health Assembly report this week, because we've got a series of problems happening, our NCD, a non-communicable disease epidemic, is, is escalating alongside our infectious disease epidemic. Uh, and she went on to talk about, alongside the children getting fatter, with undernutrition causing 45% of child deaths, resulting in 3.1 million deaths annually. And then, outside of disease, we're so well aware, 21st century world is a world of war that we have ignored. Wars in Africa, what's happening in Sudan, what's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in Central African Republic, what's happening in Syria. Since 2014, 10,000 children have lost their lives to Syrian violence. There's a huge problem. So, as I say, we've got this situation where in the past there was optimism. Way back in the past there was the assumption that well, we would have this infectious diseases stream, but as, the, uh, as we knew more, as public health interventions got better, as we increased our, our uh, economic ability to manage, we believed and we're right to believe that the rate of infectious diseases would decrease as countries got richer, as public health got, systems got better. We witnessed, and we are witnessing, the rate of non-communicable diseases increasing as well as countries get richer. And the bit that we didn't register was that the rates of non-communicable diseases and infectious diseases would increase as countries get poorer. We didn't register that. We didn't think that could happen. Non-communicable diseases, always diseases of the rich, the luxury diseases, infectious diseases, the diseases of poverty. And suddenly we've got this vortex going on. A difference in a whole different paradigm shift is required to think now, how do we deal with infectious diseases, dealing with non-communicable diseases? Omram's comment in 1971, this, this linear transition is no, not viable. And yet our systems are still functioning as if there was a linear transition. This is a slide from Bangladesh, um, which Richard Smith, who is who head, who's, who's chair of the, um, the, 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 the Bangladeshi ICDRB, sorry, saying it wrong, um, who will be here tomorrow. And you can see across from 74 to 2006 this transition between communicable and non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases rising. Communicable diseases still there, though, still needing support. This is an, another couple of slides, and you know, there's hundreds of slides, and for, please forgive the typo in the middle of this one. Um, the 10 leading causes of death in the world today, 2012, ischemic heart disease, stroke, COPD, lower respiratory infection. You can, you can go down, look at the comparison of leading causes of death today, 20 to, or 2012 to 2000, shifts. Why? Why so many deaths? That's a different question than why infectious diseases in the world today or why non-communicable diseases. And I know we're going to have some discussions about what we can do, but I want you to leave, if, I want you to leave with any question. It's just why are there so many deaths? Because so many are preventable today. Why so many deaths? Slide. There's multiple slides, as you know. Many of you have produced them. Multiple slides that show across the globe the situation. So we know we've got a lot of evidence, but what we can do. The number of malaria reported deaths in 2010. You can see again just where, which countries. Okay, malaria endemic countries, but people who are caught in poverty being affected. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, the death rates per 100,000 of the population. Look at this in 2008. Again, you're seeing a similar theme here, where the dark where the dark is, where the dark red or the dark blue. Countries that are poor, countries that are really experiencing problems. Our Millennium Development Goals come to their head, as it were, come to fruition, fulfilment, 2015. These goals that were set in 2000, 15 years of achievable, we hope, targets to change the world 
and MDG 6, very much an important goal, looking at HIV, looking at TB, looking at malaria, looking at other diseases, looking at where we're at. There's a huge amount has happened over these last 15 years. But the problem is there's a huge amount that hasn't happened and a huge distance to go. And we know, when we reflect back to that first slide with Kaplan's views of global health, there was a real message that global health was about equity within nations and across nations. And we know for many nations there may have been successes in the capitals, successes in the big cities of reducing the number of people with HIV or increasing the number of people with antiretrovirals or managing malaria. But actually out in rural regions, situations are not so much better. Today I think you're going to be looking much more in, in detail around some of the, the big killer diseases that we know and uh, looking at the, the pathogens, looking at where we're, where we're at, looking at ways of tackling, looking at the fact of where are the viruses, where, what, what can we do. And we have um, just announced very recently our new global strategy and targets to end TB. And as many of you will reflect, folks like, you know, Clifford, we thought we were in a situation of nearly ending TB 20 years ago. We thought things were really moving ahead. How do you go? I do various um, pieces of work, um, particularly here in, in Scotland, but also in um, uh, countries in Africa. And obviously HIV dominates. And HIV is significant here in Scotland as well. And it's an extraordinary global pandemic. Um, it's so easy to give the figures without actually realising that each figure, each individual figure is a person a mother, a father, or a child, or a grandmother, a brother, a sister, and they're living with or dying from HIV. 75 million people infected with HIV in the time, and today, 35 million people living with it. 35 million deaths, AIDS-related deaths. They're so hard to imagine those figures because they're so absolutely huge. But I thought I would also put this slide up, our healthy life expectancy, as we think, as we do a transition now. Because it's possible. Healthy life is possible. We know that. Our countries where there's extraordinary longevity, it's possible. But something's happening about equity. And these are the people who often are not able, for whatever reason, and often a reason which we don't believe we have a, a, an ability to control, but actually, all of us in this room have a little bit of an ability to make a change. And a small change can make something bigger, because these are the people infected. And this is one of the, of the positive things. South Africa, look at the number of people in antiretrovirals. Um, look at that extraordinary shift of people. And you'll remember that at one point, folks said, there's no way we can uh, put in a, a, a vast campaign to en en enable um, people from different African communities to uh, be put on antiretrovirals and Clifford and Mike know so much about this argument and they were part of saying we can, we can make a difference, we, it, things can change to over two million people now on antiretrovirals. So this health agenda, the challenge of this health agenda that we're in at the minute, we've got these unfinished business with the MDGs because 2015 we won't be complete. But we've also got this changed agenda. It's not that NCDs have replaced infectious diseases. We've got a vortex now of the both. And we've got this situation where the global health players are actually looking at something different with the new Sustainable Development Goals agenda that's coming forward after 2015. And there's a, there's a big flux, a big, big conversation on at the minute, which looks as if it's saying the same thing, but actually it's got different meanings and different repercussions depending on whether we go and say universal health coverage, we need to have services everywhere. That's what's important. That's where we're going to put as, as sort of the singular health goal. Or are we, as some other folks are arguing, and it's in, in, in discussion, actually the singular health goal has to be healthy life at all ages for all. 
because it has to be about valuing everybody, about the most vulnerable in communities, rather than valuing the service systems in communities. It may seem to be the same thing, but at the minute, UN, WHO, there's a big discussion going. Are we going to prioritise the, I won't say the ethics and the value of the person, or are we going to prioritise the system which do you, which do you weigh up? A lot of players are on the, on the field. Increasingly, lots and lots and lots of players. Players that you might not imagine being on the field. Think, why? We're working with all of these people. We need to engage with them as well, because sometimes if we say, we'll engage with this group and not this group, we can actually have counter and unhelpful and almost negative systems coming in, where two or three people are doing the same thing, or two or three people are countering against each other. These are only a snapshot of the people in the field in global health today, so many. Now, I want to just very quickly say one thing, one other thing, and that's about, we look at infectious diseases and we look at non-communicable diseases and we look at neglected tropical diseases and the new emerging infectious diseases. And in the end of the day, you know, our goal is for healthy life for all and our goal must be to prevent preventable deaths. But part of our goal, I would argue, and this is from my own perspective, my work, our goal also is to ensure that we must recognise that while we can push death, we can't stop death. And people will die. And it's really important, whether we're in the infectious disease sphere or the non-communicable disease sphere, whichever sphere, that we actually think in the end, what's happening to those people who are living and dying with disease? And what's happening to those folks who don't have access to end-of-life care, palliative care? I just want to say, there's three, three, for me, there's three delays. Um, that really influence the lack of palliative care in many African countries, and actually many South Asian countries, um, in the north of Europe, in, in, in Russia, in parts of China, in, in, in parts of South America. And it's around about a delay in knowing what's happening. So few people are prepared to actually speak the truth towards the end of life about diseases, a disease that doesn't have a cure, a disease that's terminable. So many families have said to me in my work in Africa, I, I've spent all my money. We've always been searching for cures and never finding them. Hoping against hope that if we went to the traditional healer, we went to another hospital, we found another doctor, somebody could give us some other different tablets that might make a difference. And the children have been taken out of school because there's no money left. There has to be things we can do. A delay in receiving the right level of care. That's a responsibility that we, we have to take on. And my, for me, one of the hardest things I ever heard was a, 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 a woman I was working with, a Kenyan woman, who said to me, I want to go to sleep and wake up dead because the pain is so great. There was no morphine available. She was using paracetamol, Panadol, chewing them. That was it regardless of the disease. There's ways that we can make things change. We know there's delays, but we know there are things that all of us can, can do. And as we think about this, we can. And a delay in getting to the right place in which to be cared for. I mentioned silo systems. If anything in the future we do is to try and draw together our services so that we remove the pain that people feel from trying to go. I try to get my antiretroviral medicine from one place, but then I've got to go to a different place for the drugs for Kaposi sarcoma. That's very common, the sense of having to go one place, another place, another place, another place. Goodness, it's common here in the UK. It's common here in Edinburgh, our silo systems. Something about what we can do in global health can be reflected back into local health. Getting to the right place at the right time to be cared for in the right way. There's one last graph that shows where palliative care is. And you can see the oranges, the reds, the yellows. Um, even the yellows are, 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 are questionable, some of them, where there's very limited or, or uh, um, real coverage. So one last, last couple of slides. And what's an underground map doing here? You one of the things what we all can do is to get, to get more together. There's so many disconnected plans and so many fantastic ideas that are going, but we're not quite sure where the end 
uh, tube station is. We don't necessarily have the path. We have our own pathway, but it's not necessarily joining up. So I wonder, is there ways, are there ways of really making a difference? Well, one of the biggest differences in our 21st century is mobile technology. It's extraordinary. This is a, a, a map of, from 2013 just showing some of the subscriptions, the mobile coverage. It, an extraordinary change has happened over these last 10 years of the number of, of, of people who, who have mobile technology. Look at this in Africa. January, it's maybe hard to see, but January 1999 is those little green dots of where there was mobiles. Look at it and keeping going where there's more and more and more coverage um, extension. Mobile cellular penetration rates are predicted, well, that's, and this is an older slide from the thing, was looking at 68%. They've gone beyond this. We're talking about extraordinary numbers of people in Africa, Asia, having mobile phones. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because mobile technology, e-health, m-health, can be one of the ways in which we create the mechanism to, to draw all of us together, but also to reach those. And I'll give you an example. In, in a lot of my work in, in setting up services for people with, uh, in palliative care, with palliative care needs, some of it's working with community health workers who have phones, who can phone in and say, I'm with this family now, I'm in this house, and... Um, the man is very ill now and the wife is asking such and such and such and such and what should I do? Should I do this or should I do that? Phoning into the nurse who says, if you can do this and if you can give this and if you can change that, that would be great. Keep them at home, keep them, keep them still. That's invaluable. That costs the family nothing. Whereas the family otherwise would have been trying to get the poor man into a matatu, get him 20, 30, 40 kilometres to a hospital to queue at a really busy outpatient, to wait and wait and wait to be told, uh, just take, take, keep take, taking your tablets or there's nothing, or just wait till tomorrow. So many differences. Mobile phones can make this extraordinary difference. So finally, our Global Health Academy here at the University of Edinburgh, and it's very much um, working alongside the Edinburgh Infectious Disease Unit this is part of the academy, but all of us, whether you're a member of Edinburgh University or whether you're part of um, uh, a member of another university or a member of a different organisation, the academy is open for, for membership. It's offering um, just an opportunity to get to work with some of the, uh, you know, the experts in Edinburgh, but for our experts in Edinburgh to have an opportunity to work with other experts across the globe and share working interdisciplinary research, working at postgraduate training together, building together resources. It's a, and these, these are some of the research themes that are there. And if there's things that you find that you would be interested in, do, do get in touch. I want to finish with three premises, because they're the premises that I think should underpin, it underpins the academy, but I think it underpins all our work. We're born equal. I really believe that. But do we all, that there is no hierarchy within humanity? We are born equal. What about social equity and justice? If we are born equal, if I am as equal as someone in every other country in the world, and they are as equal as me, but we are born into very unequal circumstances, and we die in them, but we can do something. So that's a premise, a premise that should de define our work. Another premise that defines our academy work, but I think is part of your solutions as well, part of all our solutions, is that actually the answers to many of the world's problems are there already. In the world, they're just not in the places we thought they were. They're not, sometimes with the people we assume will have them, the academics or the, the pharma companies or, or some of the, the sort of the, the governments. Actually, they're often villages. People know how to make systems work. Knowledge sits in different places. How can we find that? How can we share that? And sharing knowledge across the boundaries is, is crucial. Because only by partnerships, across and within disciplines, so not just in, me in medicine, not just in nursing, not just in economics, not just in chemistry or geography, but sharing those, we can actually come together to divert a storm. So you're very welcome to, to come um, to, get to know more about the Global Health Academy and uh, today just to think as well around ways that your work fits in and could be profiled um, together so that we could share with our partners. There's um, information about it. Thank you. Thank you.